it's a pleasure to be here to see so many people interested in what I love, which is Vermont geology. And I feel so lucky to be in Vermont to see this beauty. This is from the top of the building that I teach at, looking towards the Green Mountains. And it's gorgeous. Look the other way, you see the Adirondacks. Beneath this surface beauty, though, if you get down below the trees, below the grass, below the gravel, you get to the true inner beauty of Vermont, which is the bedrock. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. The bedrock has tremendous story to tell about the origin of Vermont. Not necessarily the origin you think about. We're talking about Vermont as it was hundreds of millions of years ago. So what geologists do, fortunately, we don't have to strip away all that surface beauty, because I like surface beauty too. But the inner beauty pokes up in the hills, in the mountains, in the ridges, and you can piece together what is below the gravel and below the soil and below the grass. And geologists do that to put together a picture of what is beneath all that. And then we take those rocks, we analyze them further to try to put together a story of how those rocks came to be and what the history of the rocks in Vermont is. So we'll do that today for you. So cast your minds back 480 million years ago, maybe. If you were in the Adirondacks, that would have been the only dry land here at that time. Looking towards the east, you see some shallow water. Right where we are, right below here, the rocks were forming in this very shallow ocean. Then further out to the east, you see deeper water, and then you see the mountain out in the background, it's a volcano. So there probably were line, chain of volcanoes, who knows, maybe 100 or 200 miles away from where we are, would be below water here, but in this location. So what I want to try to do today is to show you some of the things that we use to figure this out. And I'm not going to go into great detail. I'm trying to avoid as much jargon as I can, but sometimes I get lost and I go off into jargon. Let me know. Say, I don't understand what you're talking about. Ask a question anytime. And I have a handout that you, some of you have. On one side, it's a map of Vermont. We'll talk about that. On the other side are some very basic terms that I will mention as we go through the talk. So here's what I want to do. Give you some evidence that there was an ancient ocean here. I can say it, but what's the evidence? Evidence that there were ancient volcanoes at one time in parts of Vermont. Talk about plate collisions, plate tectonics, and the Bennington Folds. How many of People have seen the Bennington Fold down, oh great, in that area. So I'll try to remind me if I forget to mention it to talk about them. And then talk about a plate tectonic history. And that simply means movement of parts of the earth through time that put together the, the geology of Vermont. And the takeaway message is first there was no ocean, then there was an ocean, and then there was no ocean. Do you remember that? That's all you need to know from this talk. I'm done. All right. Let me put it in context, state it maybe more formally. Vermont is part of a, a large chain of uh, mountains, the Appalachians go all the way from Alabama up through Pennsylvania, New York, Vermont, up into Quebec, up into Newfoundland, and actually all the way across the Atlantic into Scotland and into Scandinavia all formed at roughly the same time. So when we talk about Vermont, we're looking at a microcosm of a much larger mountain system. But today we're going to focus on Vermont. Just remember that it can be applied elsewhere. And some of the stuff I talk about will be information from other parts of the Appalachians. So here's the real takeaway message, I guess. The ancestral Appalachians, meaning when they were first formed as rocks, were built by formation and destruction of ocean basins. No ocean, then there was an ocean, then it was destroyed. And over that time period, all the rocks were deposited or formed by volcanoes, and then during the destruction of that ocean, 
they were reheated, buried to great depths, and get the rocks that we see today. When did it happen? Four, 600, 400 million years ago. Where? Whoa, 20 degrees south of the equator. We'll talk about that. So here's a, the bedrock map of Vermont, or Vermont laid bare, if you like. Strip away all the soil, and you see all these colors. These colors represent rocks of different ages, formed in different conditions. And you see, it's very complicated. Lots of colors down around here. Look at that. Very complicated. So we're not going to deal with this complication. I'm going to simplify it into these main one, two, three, four, five, six, seven belts of rocks. And what I've done here is grouped together all the rocks that I think formed under similar environmental conditions at roughly the same time. So we can talk more about how those form rather than to deal with every single individual rock that you see. So the Taconic Belt, you probably know that. It's not too far from here. I don't know my directions, but slightly west of here would be the Taconics. Uh, Champlain Valley Belt goes all the way from the Vermont Valley down here all the way up through Middlebury, Burlington. And that belt can be traced all the way to Alabama at one end and all the way up to Newfoundland at the other end. And then something called the Laurentian Basement, which we'll talk about in a bit, and the Green Mountain Belt, Moortown Belt, Connecticut Valley Belt, and then the Bronson Hill Belt. We're going to deal mostly with the from central Vermont west. I'm going to don't really have time to go into everything about Vermont, so I won't talk much about the ones in eastern Vermont. But you can ask me questions about it afterwards if you like. So let's build this map, if you like, and build the story as we build the map. So you have your handout, I think. So the very f oldest rock is right next door to the east of here. This pink area is the Laurentian basement called Laurentia, because the continent at that time was called Laurentia, not North America. And that is over a billion years old. And it's a rock called Nice, which is, means it's been subjected to very high pressures and very high temperatures, buried at great depth. And you can consider that to be the basement to all of Vermont, like the basement is to your house. Everything else was built on top of it. So if you were to drill down through the Green Mountain Belt here, you probably would hit that basement rock or drill down through the Champlain Valley, you would hit it. And it extends all the way over and meets up with the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks are the oldest rock around here, but they're exposed here in little bits and pieces. So they sort of protrude up through the overlying stories of Vermont. And then in addition to having these stories, if you like, laid on top of them, you have rocks that were shoved in from Massachusetts and New, and New Hampshire and disrupted all of Vermont at the time and caused a lot of uh, what we call deformation or burial and uh, folding, like the Bennington Fold, and faulting. And we'll talk about that as well. So first, though, let's talk about the evidence for the existence of an ancient ocean. Where do we look to find that? Has anybody seen? Any evidence that there might have been an ocean here at one time? Limestone and marble. Limestone and marble. All right. And where do you find those in those belts? Which one? Champlain Valley. Yes. Right here. There's evidence of an ocean there and also in the Taconic Belt, which is very close to here. And here's the, the first bit of evidence. This is actually Crown Point, New York, but it's got a good exposure of the same unit here. This is limestone, and some of my students from a course I teach called Bedrock Geology of Vermont. And I love it, get out in the field every single week. But limestone is important because it only forms, A, in ocean water. Well, I shouldn't say only. It mostly forms in ocean water and in warm ocean waters. It basically forms by biological material that take calcium and carbonate out of the ocean into their skeletons, basically their bones. And then those 
those that they die and become part of the rock. So when you see limestone, you can be pretty sure that it formed in pretty warm waters within about 20 degrees of the equator. And it also contains some very important fossils. And this is a giant squid-like animal from about 470 million years ago or so, called nautiloid, found at Crown Point. And it lived in shallow water, and it needed to have algae close by. And algae needs sunlight. So we know that the, the waters were pretty shallow, shallow enough for sunlight to penetrate through. Likewise, corals. You're probably, if you've been down to the Bahamas or Florida, and if you've done any snorkeling or wading, you've probably seen corals in the oceans there. Well, there were lots of coral colonies here at one time, again, about 470 million years ago. And this is the coral fossil right here, shallow, warm waters near continents, not way out in the middle of an ocean. Likewise, this, this is a very common fossil in Champlain Valley. It's a snail, a coiled snail, and it grazed in shallow water and, and grazed on algae. Shallow water. Bennington Bypass. These layers are limestone mostly, and with a little bit of other rocks in there. So they were deposited in that shallow ocean at roughly 470 million years ago, give or take a few million years. And you notice though that the layers are not just flat, they're bent, which is another story. And sandstone up in Burlington, same thing. Shallow water, this is from a quarry, redstone quarry, redstone campus of UVM is partly built from that. Shallow water, mostly in the tidal zone, very shallow. On the other hand, if we go to these rocks, the slate near Fairhaven from an abandoned quarry, this green and purple slate, you've seen slate roofs, this is where it comes from. Here and here, down in the Pulteney River, the black is the slate, and then you have some sandstone mixed in with those layers. The slate is very deep water sediment. So it formed in deep water. And the sandstone may have been come down from shallow water into the deeper water. So we have deep water sediments for the Taconics, shallow water sediments for the Champlain Valley, but near a continent. And this is on your handout, just to reiterate, Champlain Valley, this, and this is the age range. These rocks were laid down over a long period of time. What's that, 540, 90 million years from the very oldest ones all the way up to the youngest ones in the Champlain Valley. And that's that unit right there, the conic belt, same age range roughly, but in deeper water off a continent. And very uh, quiet times geologically during that period. It's more, much more or less like the current east coast of North America. There's no, not many earthquakes, not many volcanoes, but sediments are being quietly laid down in the shallow water and then in the deeper water. But look where we were. This is going to blow your mind. This was ancient North America, and that was the equator. And north is up that way somewhere. And there's tiny Vermont, at least the start of it, right about there. And there's a very narrow ocean that's opened up probably within the last 20 million years before 540 million years. And by this time, 510, Vermont is there, and the Champlain Valley sediments are being laid down. The light blue is a shallow water, dark blue is deeper water, and the tan is continents, with the states put on there just for effect, so you know where you are. And the deconic sediments were being laid down in deeper water. So you can imagine you could be swimming right up here, but then this would be pretty deep water where you wouldn't be swimming. Okay, let's go to ancient volcanoes in Vermont. This is not Vermont, but Augustine, but before we do that, we have to, I have to give you a little lesson in modern day tectonics. You're okay with that? Good. I'm treating you like a class. I hope that's okay. Modern plate tectonics, we, uh, 
The earth is not static. It's always in motion. We're standing here. It seems like we're static, but we are actually moving. And you can divide the earth into several plates, North American plate, Eurasian, Arabian, South American, Pacific, etc. And those plates are moving with respect to each other. So that the North American plate here, for example, where we're situated there, is moving away from the Eurasian plate, and the North American plate is moving towards the Asian plate over here. So the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean is getting bigger by that motion, and the Pacific Ocean is getting smaller. Let me show you that in more detail here. The, the boundaries between those plates where they rub against each other is where all, most of the activity in geology happens, where volcanoes form, where earthquakes occur along those boundaries. And you can see the two, th three types of boundaries here. One called divergent simply means the plates are diverging. One is moving away from the other. So that here in the Atlantic, this boundary the North American plate is moving towards the west. The Eurasian plate is moving towards the east. And it's moving at, I don't know if you can read that, at about 2.3 centimeters a year. So double that's about five centimeters a year. That's roughly the rate your fingernail grows. Yeah. It doesn't seem like much, but it only took 180 million years for the Atlantic to open. It's just pretty small time. And then at convergent boundaries, right here, for example, on the west coast, a plate is hitting, coming towards the North American plate and, and diving down beneath that plate. So we have divergent, convergent coming together, and then something called transform, which we won't talk about today much at all, where plates slip past each other, and there's no moving apart, no coming together. Earthquakes occur there. The San Andreas Fault is the most famous example of that. So let me show you a different view, a cross-sectional view. Can you imagine if you drew a line through here, took a chainsaw, if you like, cut down into the earth, and then looked up at the side view of what was going on there. Basically, you have the divergent boundary there, convergent boundary there, convergent boundary on the other side. So here, what you look at, this is the ocean part Convergent boundary, called the oceanic plate, is diving down beneath South America here, diving down on the other side beneath a chain of islands north of New Zealand. And then in the middle, there is a, di a divergent boundary where what happens, material comes up from below, cools, material I mean lava, cools and forms new material, new plate right there, and then that plate is destroyed, sent back down into the mantle at these convergent boundaries. And that's very important because when things come up from the mantle, they melt, you get volcanoes at divergent boundaries, and when they go down, it causes melting as well, so you get volcanoes in that particular boundary as well. And you get different types of volcanoes in those boundaries. And hotspot we won't talk about, that's Hawaii. We won't talk about that today. But the key thing is, is that the volcanoes are occurring at these plate boundaries, moving apart, coming together. So let's look at some of the examples, a couple quickly. Iceland is right on a divergent boundary, and East Africa is a, a divergent boundary about to start. So you go to East Africa first, and this is the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, and the Great Rift Valley down through here. East Africa is pulling apart, has been for a few million years, right about here. The Red Sea has formed by splitting apart Gulf of Aden. And in there you see, in this part, right about there, this is what you see, volcanoes. And this particular type of volcano produces a rock called basalt, your very first rock name today, well, except for limestone. That's a dark lava. That's all you need to know. It's dark in color and low in silicon dioxide. It comes out here as lava flows mostly. 
And this is what it looks like when it cools, a nice dark lava, similar to what you see in Hawaii as well. To go to Iceland, again, a divergent boundary, the North American plate moving, and if you're standing right here, you're right on that boundary. This is also the site of the oldest parliament in the world, by the way. A thousand AD was the first parliament in the world established right at that building. You can just barely see it right about there. But if you look to the right, you'll see Eurasian plate. Look to the left, you see North American plate. And you get these fantastic volcanoes here. And this is a, a drone that was sent over the volcano erupting last, uh, last fall. The sound is the drone, not the volcano. So what you see here, these are, this is lava that's bubbling up, and then it's forming these beautiful lava flows, and the drone goes right over the crater, and you'll see what kind of lava is coming out in a second. This is all basalt lava. It's got some steam coming off it. There we go. So you get these minor eruptions. That's gas in the lava that is escaping and throwing the lava into the air as well. You think this ever happened in Vermont? Maybe. Also Iceland. Remember this volcano? Eyjafjallajökull. Nobody remembers that. <laughs> yeah. Or it's, it's called E15 if you can't pronounce it. E followed by 15 letters. This is the one that erupted and disrupted all the traffic between North America and Europe in 2010. And here it is. So you get some explosive eruptions as well as lava flows coming out. And we probably had a volcano like this not too far from here at one time. And we go to the convergent boundaries. And we'll take a quick look at one, a couple of places here. This is where two plates are coming together. And the example here, this is, oh, I love this video. I just found it. You got to listen to this one. This is down near New Zealand, just north of New Zealand. And they're out there. Keep your eye on that. That's an explosive volcano. Watch out for the shock. It's coming. That was a shock wave that was produced by the... Holy smoking Toledo! <laughs> That's what I say, too. So this is the type of volcano that you tend to see at convergent boundaries, like this, Mount St. Helens. Uh, produced the rock called andesite. That's also in your cheat sheet. That's a slightly different lava with more silicon dioxide and more gas, and the gas is trapped in there. And as it comes up, it expands and eventually blows the magma apart. So that's what gives you the explosive volcanoes versus the ones that flow as lava flows. Mount St. Helens in 1980 erupted. I think most of you remember that, probably. Geologists camping took these photos 10 miles away. Here's what it looked like before the eruption, after. This took about a minute total to go from that to that. Tremendous amount of energy released in that volcanic eruption. Another eru uh, island that's active still, the Caribbean, the Montserrat, producing a rock andesite, has lava flows here, as well as ash coming out. Again, convergent boundary, high silica. And here's the ash flow coming down the hillside. These are the dangerous parts of volcanoes. When the ash comes up and then it collapses on itself because it's heavier than air, and then it rushes down the sides of the mountains at about 60 to 70 miles an hour, and it's hot, so it's very dangerous. Here it is coming down the mountain and going out onto the sea. It's so light, and it's mostly pumice now, that it floats out onto the ocean water. Uh, Another one in Chile, and this time I put this one up there because it had a different composition, even more silica, whiter colored uh, lava, more explosive, giving you this white clouds here. Another example, 
beautiful. Look at this. Almost every volcanic eruption has lightning that is formed within the ash cloud itself. It's similar to the way lightning is formed in clouds, in rain clouds, you also get them in these uh, volcanic ash clouds. Beautiful display. Italy has volcanoes. You may remember, well, I don't remember Vesuvius, but you, you've heard about Vesuvius, perhaps, erupting. Etna is the most active volcano in Europe. It erupts, is erupting right now, in fact. It erupts all the time in these beautiful fire fountains, they're called. Here's another one there, and also has lava flows. It has basalt, dark rock. So here's the takeaway from modern tectonics. Divergent boundaries, fairly mild eruptions, basalt mainly, ocean plate is created. Material creates, moves away. Convergent boundaries, very explosive eruptions, and you have a variety of rock types, basalt, andesite, rhyolite. And the ocean plate is destroyed at those boundaries. Right. <laughs> so in Vermont, we obviously don't have any active volcanoes. Any of the mountains you see are not volcanic now. They're formed by other processes. So what's the evidence that there ever was a volcano or any volcanoes in Vermont? Well, you've got to look a little deeper than just the topography here. It looks like a volcano, but it's not. So we're going to look in two places, the Green Mountain Belt and the Moortown Belt, which you can see the Green Mountain Belt comes down and it's kind of squeezed out in southern Vermont. The Moortown Belt is also squeezed out and it's most prominent in northern Vermont. And what you see there are remnants of metamorphosed volcanic rocks as well as sedimentary rocks. Metamorphosed meaning that they're not like they were when they first formed. They've been reheated and put under tremendous pressure as well. But if we look at it, the entire belt is not volcanic. I just put here this here just so you could show, I show, sorry, show you that these are just remnants, scattered bits of volcanic rock, green here and red. So they're just very, very small volumes of volcanic rocks. And, oh, come back. Right about here, I'll show you a, a close-up of that. The green is metamorphosed volcanic rock. It's called greenstone. And that's the way it is scattered throughout Vermont, just little bits and pieces. And when you look at it now, here's what it looks like. There's some of my students very excited about seeing one. It just looks like green rock, a little underwhelming, actually, as opposed to those tremendous eruptions that are going on. So you, you can't just look at it in the field and say that's a volcanic rock. I mean, as a geologist, I know that's going to be volcanic, but I know something else as well. So what you have to do is look further. If you look at it closely, that's a Vermont volcanic. This is what the real modern-day volcanic looks like doesn't look at all like it. So you can't just use the features in the field to say that was a volcanic rock or like this, not the same at all. So what do you do? Well, you collect some rocks or you have students collect some rocks, take them back, you cut the rock, you make a very thin slice so light can come through it. You can look at it under a microscope and you also take that rock and you analyze it for its chemical, chemical constituents. So once you look deeper into the rock, you can get a better idea of how it formed. So I'm just going to show you one example of how we do that, if that's all right. Here's what a Vermont volcanic looks like in, under a microscope. And you can't read the scale here, but that's uh, two millimeters across. And you can see it has, these are crystals or grains in the volcanic rock. And you see they're randomly oriented more or less. If you can compare that to a modern day volcanic from Hawaii, you see it has a similar type of texture arrangement. Would you agree with that? 
So that gives you some clue that it might be volcanic just by comparing it. But unfortunately, most Vermont volcanics don't look like that. Similar textures here. And what happens is that this original rock gets metamorphosed, put under heat and pressure, and transforms to a greenstone. So the minerals change, and you get something like this. So the textures here are completely different, but the hint is that these minerals grew from these minerals under some high temperature. But that's not very convincing, not even to me, that that was volcanic. So then you have to look deeper than that. And what do you do? You look at the role of chemistry. I'm just going to have one slide on chemistry. This is another example of a volcanic rock, in quotes, from Vermont. You can see it has these swirls in it of light and dark colored rocks. Those are probably different types of volcanic rocks that were mixed together during high pressure and high temperature burial of that rock. But we can take that, do some chemistry on it, and that can tell us a lot. So one chemistry slide. Bear with me. Uh, this is elements that you find in rocks, aluminum, silicon, iron, magnesium, calcium, just plotted here. And what's shown, these circles, rhyolite, andesite, basalt, are areas where modern day volcanic rocks would fall on this plot. And the triangles are individual rock samples from Vermont volcanic rocks. So if, you were to, if I were to ask you what is the dominant rock type in the Green Mountain Belt volcanics, what would you tell me? Basalt. Okay. As, as opposed to the Moortown Belt, look, all the compositions are all over the place. They have basalt, they have rock called dacite, and also rhyolite. Very different silica contents. So it gives us a clue that the volcanic remnants in the Green Mountain Belt are not the same as the volcanic remnants in the Moortown Belt. In fact, these probably formed at a divergent boundary, and what do you think the others formed? Got it, yeah. See, geology is pretty easy. And we've got a problem now, though. If you remember, those two belts were right next to each other. So how could you have a divergent boundary right next to a convergent boundary? Interesting question. Before we get to that, so Green Mountain volcanoes probably were formed along these large cracks in the Earth, as you find in the East African Rift today. These are fractures, and there are lavas coming up there or like Kilimanjaro is a volcano in the middle of the East African rift, and that was formed because of divergent boundary. So probably there were volcanic mountains just like that here. Or like this one in Eritrea, erupted in 2011. This is a, the crater here, and you can see the lava flowing out through here and down through here, and finally coming to rest here. And these names are, are two names that come from Hawaii, Pahoi Hoi lava and Aa lava, just describes the different nature of the surface of the lava. Whereas the Moortown belt volcanics probably look more like this. Cotopaxi in Ecuador, the highest volcano in the world, is about 15, no, 19,000 feet high above sea level. Beautiful cone-shaped volcano. Or like Augustine in Alaska, smoking away, or like Philippines has volcanoes, lavas coming out and pouring down. So you can have to imagine that along the Moortown Belt, you had these very explosive eruptions going on, like this. And this is in the Pacific again, where an island suddenly came out of the sea, if you like. So here we are. Summary. We have Green Mountain Belt, divergent boundaries, Moortown Belt, Convergent Boundary Volcanoes. And these are the ages. You don't need to really, obviously, remember that now. But one thing to note is that the Green Mountain Belt volcanoes are older 
than the Moortown Belt volcanoes. And that gives us a clue of how they could be together. They were formed at different times. They weren't being formed at the same time. So where were the Green Mountain volcanoes formed? Again, go back to this map showing the equator. North America here, slightly different version. This is Vermont now in the triangle. So the Green Mountain volcanoes would have formed as the continents were separating, in this case, the North American continent, and actually that's part of South America now, the different continent back then. Whereas the Moortown volcanics formed, say, 485, when plates were coming together. And there was a chain of volcanic islands off the coast of ancient North America. So the very second photo I showed of the volcano off in the distance, that would have been probably the Moortown volcanoes forming at that point. So how does this work? I don't know. Let's say we looked at side view of this part of the world 485 million years ago. Here's what you might see. And this is an important slide. Well, they're all important. But. So the cross section, you had a continent, and you had sediments on the edge of that continent, the Champlain Valley sediments, and the, in deeper water, the taconic sediments, and then an ocean basin with ocean plate beneath it, and then the Moortown volcanoes somewhere off in that ocean. It could have been 200 miles away. It could have been 1,000 miles away. We don't really know how far away it was. And then more ocean on the other side. But if you look at that, what do you think is going to happen given time? If you have convergent boundary right there and volcanoes forming above that convergent boundary, which way is it going to move? Right, that's going to move towards that, correct? And that's a key for understanding the Bennington Folds and everything else in Vermont. So keep that image in mind, and we'll come back to it. Now to part three, evidence for plate collisions in Vermont. When two plates collide, as an example, in India, India is here, that's Asia. India is being stuffed beneath Asia. And at one time, India was much farther away, and there was an ocean separating India from Asia. Since it's collided, and it's formed the Himalayas. Like this. So when plates collide, you get huge mountain systems, typically. And you get folds like this. So the rocks become bent during that collision. This is a collision of Africa with Europe. And this is the folds in England. This is from the Himalayas. Even at a small scale, this is a rock hammer, the layers get bent as well, large scales and at small scales. And this is folding in West Castleton, Vermont. How far away is that from here? 20 miles? That also formed during plate collision, as did folds near Montpelier. If you're ever driving an interstate, well, if you're a passenger and someone else is driving, <laughs> take a look and you'll see all these layers are crinkled and bent and folded. And the Bennington Fold. Here we go, and this is a close-up of that fold. These layers, presumably when they were laid down, were flat, horizontal, and during collision, those layers got bent like this during the collision, bent over. This is the Bennington Fold forming right there. What happens, the ocean plate disappears, the volcanic arc collides with the edge of the continent and actually moves up on top of the continent. And the continent sinks, the layers become bent, they become heated, put under high pressure, and the Green Mountains formed at that point, roughly. So, 400 million years ago, after this collision took place, Vermont would have been completely inland, and a big mountain range would have formed, probably as high as the Himalayas are today. We don't quite know the height. But now Vermont is there, and, and the ocean, part of the ocean is closed, 
and you have this mountain range, and there's still more ocean out here. But. So back to the, to the map. Plate collision at about this time, and the Moortown Belt comes smack against the Green Mountain Belt because of that collision. And you have what's called a suture, which makes sense. This is where the continents have been sutured together, like if you're getting an operation and you're, and you're cut open and you're sutured back together. Exactly the same thing. Any questions on that part? All right, now we're going to go through a plate tectonic history of Vermont from the beginning. 540 million years ago, Green Mountain volcanoes were forming here. North America, as it existed then, looked like that. And these other continents are not even recognizable now. What's happening a little bit later here, chain of volcanoes forms off the coast. That's the eastern Vermont volcanoes or the Moortown volcanoes. What happens? That convergent boundary brings the volcanic chain closer to the edge of the continent, collides, forms a mountain range, keeps colliding, forms more of a mountain range, keeps colliding, keeps colliding, until finally all the continents come together to form Pangaea. You may have heard of that at that time. And here's Pangaea now. Most of the continents together, the rest of the world is ocean. Vermont is in the middle right there. And then Pangaea starts to break up. And look at this. Vermont is finally starting its northward journey from the tropics here to there to there to there to there. Slowly. Keep your eye on India. Notice India down there? That's India, breaking away from Antarctica. Oops, it jumped across the ocean, collided with Asia right about there to form Himalayas. Meanwhile, Vermont is pretty much back up to the 45 degree latitude, roughly. And now we're getting continents that look more or less like they do today to the present time. Here's where we are today. You want to see what your future looks like? <laughs> okay. Well, 150 million years from now, here's a speculation. There will be a convergent boundary on the east coast of North America, and we'll have volcanoes back in Vermont again, explosive volcanoes. And if you go another 100 million years, you get back to another one continent, and that ocean closes up in Africa and North America and South America snugly fit together as they did 200 million years ago. This is a summary diagram here. Sorry, just one last thing. And the reason I did this is so you could take this away and, well, you can study it if you want, but just have it as a keepsake. And I didn't cover the stuff in eastern Vermont because I didn't want to prolong the story. It's a long story several hundred million years. But basically, these rocks were formed at a later time by a similar process, ocean closing and continents colliding. I will take any questions you might have. You showed all the continents together, Pangaea, I think, mm -hmm. and they all sort of went apart, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna come back together again. And my question is, what powers these continental shifts. The driving force be behind all that is gravity. Because if you think about a convergent boundary, there's the plate that's moving down, it's actually sinking and pulling along the continent that's behind it. So it's just pulling along that continent here, and then somewhere else, another convergent boundary is pulling a continent. They will eventually collide. So it's just by accident that they all get together in one spot. And then they break apart because the continents heat up from the mantle. And by doing that, they split. It's almost like, um, what's the analogy for that? It's almost like if you blow up a, a balloon and, and the balloon will, could crack as you blow it up more and more. Well, heat from the mantle actually causes the continents to rise and split 
as it's doing in, in East Africa. So that happens, and then divergent boundaries bring them together again. We know of at least three times in Earth history where all the continents were together. There was one about a billion years ago, and the one about 300 million years ago, and there will be one again in 250 million years. Um, regarding the Bennington Fold, it's, I always feel sad when I go past there now because it seems to be eroding away, and it seems like such a natural wonder to yeah. be in a teachable place mm -hmm. available to everybody. You don't have to go off in the woods. Is there anything <laughs> that can be done mm. to save that? Mm. <laughs> Geoengineering. Uh, well, no, not really. Yeah, unless you want to you know, put some fencing up there, which I think would destroy the, the look of it anyway. And, and those rocks are, are crumbly. I mean, they are breaking apart. So that's part of natural history. Have you uh, seen any evidence of pillow lava on the western side of the Greens? Uh, yes, but way up north very near the Canadian border. And if you go into Quebec, you see lots of them. Vermont, you come south and things get messed up. But right there, there are pillow lavas. And if people don't know, pillow lavas are a form that lava takes when it erupts into water. It erupts into water and it comes out almost like squeezing toothpaste out of a, out of a tube. And it squirts out and then it forms a crust and it looks like pillows. That's why it's called pillow lava, or bread crusts, or something like that. So if you see that, you know it erupted into water. Where do glaciers fit into the long-term picture? Like glacial till, right. glaciers moving down? Is there a periodicity to, to glaciers? Uh, there is. The, the glacial story in Vermont, I'll just talk about Vermont, is much younger than all of this. It's like 20,000 years ago, glaciers came through here. And they actually carved what we see now as the Green Mountains. So the, the height of the Green Mountains that we see is mostly because of glaciers and erosion. So not the result of that original mountain system. So the, the glaciers, uh, there certainly is uh, cyclicity to glaciers over time. Um, but you can't say that one's going to come every 30,000 years. But they're worked out under different scales, 100,000 year cycles, there are 20,000 year cycles in different parts of the world. So, yeah, in Vermont, though, the only thing that's affected the landscape really has been the, the late, latest one. You know, when Gia comes back to the tavern three times that we know of, do they always come back in the same part of the water? No. Or they different parts of the globe? Different parts of the globe and different configurations of continents come together. Because if you think about the Atlantic is opening now, North America is separating from Europe. But when they come back together, Africa may come in and hit North America. And Europe will go off somewhere else. So the configurations are different. Crazy world. Oh, the question was, why does Vermont have so f few ores, or copper and tin and lead and things like that? Uh, mostly because, well, not mostly because, but because there weren't a lot of volcanoes. I mean, there were some, but not many. The uh, Elizabeth Mine, if you know about that one in eastern Vermont, it's been closed for a while. That was a copper mine at one time. That probably was formed in one, a volcano at one time. But basically, most this part of Vermont is all sedimentary. Uh, so you're not going to get copper and lead. You might get some lead zinc. And I don't know why you don't. I think people have looked here, but they haven't found it. How and why were, was the shale formed? Uh, shale is a, essentially a mud, so a deep ocean deposit up the edge of the continent in the deep ocean water. You have muds. Those muds are compacted by more muds on top, turns to shale, and turns to slate. So the Deconics 
were formed in the deep ocean. Then they were shoved up onto the top of the continent, and that's why we see them today. Uh, oftentimes, walking along the brooks, and I live uh, in the Takai. Right. I will pick up pieces of slate with marble intrusions, and I'm thinking deep water, shallow water. <laughs> oh, You're, that's a perfect question. Here's uh, what we think happened. The, uh, I don't have my blackboard, sorry. The uh, Taconics were deeper waters. You had shallow water sediments up here, let's say Taconics down there. So mostly they're accumulating s mud and shale, but occasionally you would get some shallow water sediments coming down this, the continental slope and mixing in with the shale. That's why we know it was close to the continent. If it had been away from the continent, it was all shale, no carbonate, no sandstone. This is going to sound like a really stupid question, but um, were this beautiful green and blue ball spinning through space, and it's hot in the middle, the earth is hot in the middle, it's molten iron, something down there, and it's, it's been around for a billion years, roughly speaking. 4.5 billion. Okay. Um, That's rough. How long is it going to be able to stay warm? There's a good one. That's a good one. Well, you know, it's only molten in the outer part of the core. Most of the Earth is solid, except for little bits of volcano, volcanic rock coming up. So most of it is, is still solid, and it's cooling. So every time a volcano erupts, it's cooling the Earth. And that's a natural way that the Earth is going to eventually stop cooling, and I don't know when. Maybe, who knows? But when that happens, plate tectonic shuts down, no more volcanoes, no more earthquakes, no more people, and it's all done. No but, what's that? No more, no more, well, gravity will be there, yeah. But I, I don't know what the estimates are. Probably talking still about billions of years before it cools and stops plate tectonics. Go north from Manchester. We live on the eastern slopes of the Greens. It seems like all the marble stuff is over there on the conics. And where we are, we have um, you know different kinds of soil. Very little marble unless it's, unless it's crumbling. Is that just as simple as two different belts? Or is it? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure exactly where you are, but I, I suspect that you're looking to the east at the ancient basement rocks. Are you going up into the higher parts of the Green Mountains? I'm just talking about being on the east side of, of Route, Route 7, 7, on the yeah, east Route Dorset 7. Ridge. Yeah. Is, and we don't have any marble mines there. We don't cross it where the core is. Right. So on the east side of Route 7, you definitely go into the, to the basement rocks. In the valley itself, you're in the Champlain Valley rocks. And then on the west, you're in the Taconics. So you might be looking at the, the gneisses and schists of the... Laurentian basement, that pink on your, possibly, yeah. I'd have to look at a, I have a map here, we can look at details if you want. Um, it's come out that they say that fracking could cause earthquakes. Do they frack all the way down 60 miles? Uh, no, the faults are much shallower. So the, the plate is that thick but the faults occur all the way through the plate, right up to the surface. So you have, you have faults, the San Andreas, for example, breaks the surface. So you do have faults very close to the surface, and fracking has been shown to cause minor earthquakes in Ohio. So what happens is the fluid is pushed down, and then if it comes up into these fractures, uh, in a way it lubricates them, if you like, and causes them to move more easily. Exactly, yeah to get an earthquake big enough to feel, anyway. I mean, as you fracture a rock, it's creating small earthquakes. That's the definition of an earthquake, is whenever there's movement along a fault. What's your opinion on the uh, retreat of the last ice age that we had here? My opinion? Or <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as I understand it, do you want kind of the story as it went back? 
The ice covered here, say 20,000 years ago, would have been about a mile thick here, all the way down to Long Island, was the farthest south the ice sheet got. And then it started retreating maybe 18,000 years ago. If you were here 14,000 years ago, it would have been a glacial lake. And where's Norris? That way. <laughs> okay. And north of here, maybe up in northern Vermont into Quebec, would have been the edge of the ice. And in front of that ice would have been a big glacial lake. And that laid down all that gunky clay that we hate when we try to farm. And then it went 11,000 years ago, farther north into Quebec, so far north that the land was depressed and the ocean came in. So the Lake Vermont is called, which is a freshwater lake in front of the glacier, turned to the Champlain Sea, which is a saltwater lake. And that's why we find a whale in the Champlain sediments. You can see the whale up in UVM. And then as the glacier got farther north, the land came back up, shut off the ocean from it, and Lake Champlain formed. Short version. I hope there are no glaciologists here. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for showing up. <laughs>